Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to do an expose on Starbucks, the deep, dark underbelly of Starbucks. Is it just a coffee company or something far more nefarious? Well, you be the judge. Starbucks Corporation is an American coffee company and coffee house chain that was founded in Seattle, Washington in 1971. And as of 2018, the company operates 34,000 locations worldwide. Starbucks first became profitable in Seattle in the early 1980s. And now there are Starbucks locations open in Tokyo, Dubai, and even in the Middle East. In 2017, Starbucks' net earning amounted to $3.1 billion, which was up significantly from approximately $2.89 billion the year before. Again, Starbucks Corporation reported earnings amount to approximately $3.1 billion. So why is this massive coffee conglomerate the choice of celebrities and Joe citizens around the world? Well, upon closer look, Starbucks has a deep, dark secret. Today, I'm going to examine the Starbucks logo, the company, and its agenda. So let's begin. When you see that Starbucks logo, you probably think the same thing as me. There is that Smiling Mermaid logo. There must be some good overpriced coffee nearby. Or maybe there's that evil Starbucks corporation that's helping to destroy the world. Listen, I like coffee a lot. Even so, I avoid Starbucks coffee like the plague. And though their coffee is admittedly good, I refuse to drink it, buy it, or even walk in the door. Why is that? Well, I'm going to get into this expose and you're going to see why. Now, it's not just that their affiliation with Planned Parenthood. I mean, that's disgusting enough. That's not going to be really the focus of this expose. And by the way, the Planned Parenthood thing is just the beginning of Starbucks' list of offenses. Starbucks not only supports same-sex marriage, but they even signed an amicus briefing asking the Supreme Court to overturn state marriage laws. Obergefell v. Hodges, 2015. Starbucks contributes to Girls, Inc., a pro-abortion organization. It receives a score of 100 on the Human Rights Campaign's Corporate Equality Index, which is the standard standard bearer for the liberal LGBTQ political agenda, which also opposes religious freedoms. And with such insidious designs on life, marriage, the family, and Christianity, I really started wondering about the Starbucks logo several years ago. A couple years ago, when Louisiana woman received two cups of, check out this photo, Megan Pinion from Louisiana received these two designs written in caramel on her cup. But I want to talk today a little more about the logo and what this company represents. So co-founder Howard Schultz elaborates a bit more in the story in the excerpt from a book that I have a copy of. It's called Pour Your Heart Into It, How Starbucks Built a Company One Cup at a Time. The legendary logo design is the brainchild of Terry Heckler. When we were originally looking for a logo for Starbucks in 1971, we wanted to capture the seafaring tradition of early coffee traders. We poured over old marine books until we came up with the perfect logo. It was based on an old 15th century Norse woodcut, a two-tailed mermaid encircled by the store's original name, Starbucks Coffee, Tea, and Spice. That early siren, the bare-breasted and Rubenesque, was supposed to be as seductive as coffee itself. The first ever Starbucks logo designed in 1971 features the topless siren with her double fishtail and navel fully exposed. The logo design comprised of a circular ring surrounding the mythical two-tailed mermaid figure in a coffee brown color palette. Here you can see the original Starbucks logo bears an uncanny resemblance to an entry in G.E. Circlet's Dictionary of Symbols, which wasn't even published in English until 1962. There's something just not right about this crowned mermaid and the way she's holding her double fishtail. So let's get into that. Who is this Starbucks mermaid and why is she wearing a crown? According to the symbol dictionary, the twin-tailed mermaid is Melusine, a siren, an anguipede body type, who is also a symbol in alchemy. 
The legend of Melusine runs deep in French history, even to the days of Charlemagne. Several royal house trace their lineage from Melusine's family, including the houses of Anjou. Many rulers of French descent throughout history, including Richard the Lionheart, have claimed to be descended from the devil. And as cited by historian Flory, the chronicler Gerard Le Cambrian reports that King Richard was fond of telling a tale that he was a descendant of a Countess of Anjou, who was in fact a Melusine. He concluded that his whole family came from the devil and would return to the devil. The Duke of Berry commissioned Jean de Rest in 1393 to write an account of the story of Melusine. It was said that Melusine was a daughter of Pressina, a water fairy marine spirit, and a mortal man, King Helmus. Melusine wasn't born a mermaid. It was an affliction created by her mother as punishment for what she did to her father. And there's a whole story every Sabbath day thereafter, her lower half transforming into a fish or a serpent. There's a whole story on that from French folklore. Now let's talk about the Starbucks product placement in an 18th century cathedral. This she-dragon creature has made multiple appearances in iconography as well as history. The oldest known image of Melusine, the twin-tailed mermaid, is actually on the mosaic floor of the Entranto Cathedral. And here you can see that. One section of the floor depicts images of Eden along with the tree of life growing from the back of two elephants. Otranto, the home of this cathedral, passed hands through several of history's empires, including Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Norman. Commissioned by the city's Norman rulers, the cathedral was eventually completed by local Greek-Italian monks. If that wasn't already a mix of symbols and icons, Otranto was also home to a thriving Jewish community of Kabbalists, high priests of Jewish mysticism, and it is said they are the key to understanding the unusual mosaic. Hmm, Eden, Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, and an evil serpent lady? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Lilith, the Starbucks dragon lady, bears a very close resemblance to Lilith. Lilith has been called the goddess of a thousand faces, but she's no goddess. Sometimes she's described as Adam's first wife in Gnosticism. She is typically described in literature as the devil's own wife and a child eater. Lilith is actually an entire category of demons. It is said that Lilith is a sexually wanton demon that comes in the night and stills newborn babies. There are ancient Sumerian prayers for women and newborns that call for protection from Lilith. She even appears in the scriptures. In the book The White Goddess, the poet Robert Graves describes Lilith. The goddess is a lovely, slender woman with a hooked nose, deathly pale face, lips red as rowan berries, startlingly blue eyes and long fair hair. She will suddenly transform herself into a mare, vixen, weasel, serpent, owl, she-wolf, tigress, or loathsome mermaid, a.k.a. a hag. Her names and titles are innumerable, but in ghost stories she is often featured as the White Lady, and in ancient religions from the British Isles to the Caucasus as the White Goddess. In fact, Homer says of her, Lilith frequently occurs among the archetypes of the world's cultures. She is the siren, the lady in white, Dusa in the fairy queen, even Ursula in Disney's The Little Mermaid, and of course, dragon lady Melusine. She dates back as far as 2000 BC, and again, her image is found in ancient Sumerian tablets and goes back to the worship of the Amorites. Who else is Lilith known as? Well, she's also called Gaia, the goddess of the earth. Gaia is one of the primordial elemental deities born at the dawn of creation. Gaia is the great mother of all creation. The heavenly gods were descended from her through her union with Oranos, the sea gods from her union with Pantos, and her mating with Tartarus, the pit, that's correct, and mortal creatures born directly from her earthly flesh. Gaia was the chief antagonist of the heavenly gods. First, she rebelled against her husband, Oranos, who had imprisoned several of her giant sons within her womb. Later, when her son, Kronos, 
defied her by imprisoning these same sons, she sided with Zeus in his rebellion. Finally, she came into conflict with Zeus, for she was angered for his binding of her titan sons in Tartarus. She birthed a tribe of giants and later the monster Typhius to overthrow him, but both failed in their attempts. In the ancient Greek cosmology, Mother Earth was conceived of as a flat disk encircled by the river Oceanus and encompassed above by the solid dome of heaven and earth below by the great pit, the inverse dome or Tartarus. Earth supported the seas and mountains upon her breast. In Greek base painting, Guy was depicted as a buxom matronly woman rising from the earth, inseparable from her native element. In mosaic art, she appears as a full-figured, robust woman reclining on the earth, often clothed in green. Gaia is the personification of the earth, the great goddess Gaia. She appears in the character of a divine being as early as the Homeric poems, for we read in the Iliad that black sheep were sacrificed to her and that she was invoked by persons taking oaths. In one depiction, she is said to be the female half of Apollyon. According to the Theogony of Hesiod, she was the first being that sprang from chaos and Pontus. By Uranus, she then became the mother of a series of beings, Hyperion, Rhea, Thea, Themis, Phoebe, Kronos, Cyclops, Brontes, Cotus, Brayers, and Gyges. Besides these, there were various other divinities and monsters that sprang from her. In any event, her worship appears to have been universal among the Greeks, and she had temples and altars at Athens, Sparta, Delphi, Olympia, Phileas, and other places. We have expressed statements attesting the existence of the statues of Guy in Greece. At Petra, she was represented in a sitting attitude in the Temple of Demeter. And at Athens, too, there's a statue of her. And I know you've heard of Mother Earth, since we're all riding around on her all of the time. Mother Nature. Mother Earth, the great goddess Gaia. I actually talk about her in my book, Green Gospel. Speaking of eco-friendly, carbon-neutral pagan death cults, Starbucks, too, is also going green in lockstep with United Nations Agenda 21 and Agenda 30. The seemingly benevolent Go Green Club of Saving the Planet and Curbing Human-Caused Climate Change, well, Starbucks is one of the forerunners in saving the planet and becoming eco-friendly in their assortment of reusable mugs, cups, and straws, and other lines of earth-friendly products. After all, they want to make Mother Gaia happy. As Al Gore says in his book, Earth in the Balance, that this overpopulated Earth, that poor Mother Gaia is overpopulated with her human infestation, we need to show Mother Gaia the respect. Us pizza-eating, beer-guzzling plebs on Earth, we need to bow down to the great goddess Gaia. After all, we can't give Mother Gaia a fever now, can we? is going on right now. The planet has a fever. Pete has a fever. Guess what? I got a fever. The fever is going up, not down. The planet has a fever. There's another name for Gaia. Maya, Diana, Artemis, Astaroth. Let's talk a little bit about the divine Sophia. In the Gnostic myth of how the world works, Sophia, the feminine personification of wisdom, lives happily with the spirit of light in the unified limitless potential of her father's radiance created by the twin powers of depth and silence. Sophia conceals our consciousness in the body of the Demirge's first man, Adam, and then brings it into the world as Eve. Finally, Sophia breaks free and ascends back up to the true light of life, raising humanity with her ever so slightly. But she refuses to abandon the sad world of humans, and so she divides herself, keeping a part below and a part above, ever present and available for the enlightenment of all. Here, we may call that Gaia, the consciousness of the world. So Gnosticism is really a twinning, a marriage or a reunification of balancing both the sacred feminine with the masculine ego of unrealized potential into one androgynous whole. Androgynous? Hmm. You mean male and female? Well, here's the original gender bender himself. Again, the feminine heart of the earth, Diana, Gaia, Maya, Sophia is the feminine divine. 
Just a side note, it's funny that the new character belongs on an island named Diana. What else is she called? Oh, that's right. Wonder Woman. Diana Prince, the ambassador of the Amazonian warrior goddesses. Is it weird that originally in the comics, Diana Prince worked at the United Nations? Hmm. It's interesting that her creator from DC Comics actually says in a biography that Artemis was one of the most venerated ancient Greek deities and was worshipped as a fertility goddess, Diana of Versailles, the Roman version of the goddess Artemis, was where he got the inspiration for Diana, Wonder Woman. And by the way, Sophia is Shakti in Sanskrit, powerful Hindu personification of feminine wisdom in the transcendental state of Samadhi, or Gnosis. It's said she's the compassionate Bodhisattva in Buddhism, returning light the path to nirvana or gnosis. They say Mother Mary in her ascendant form and Mary Magdalene as the earthly companion of Jesus Christ in Christian Gnosticism. Yeah, there really is Christian Gnosticism. In Jungian psychology, she is the unifying power of both the feminine and masculine art types, anima and animus, also incubus and succubus, and the lower self of the psyche with the higher spiritual self, gnosis. And again, Artemis was the Roman equivalent of Diana or Maya or Gaia, Artemis was often described as the daughter of Zeus and the twin sister of Apollo. She was the Hellenic goddess of the hunt, wilderness, the protector of the earth, and the goddess of fertility. She is often depicted as a huntress carrying bow and arrows. In later Hellenistic times, she even assumes more ancient roles of aiding in childbirth. Hmm, too bad Planned Parenthood doesn't do that. She's also the goddess of the ocean and the moon. She is associated mostly with Isis, who is the most beloved female, Orisha. She is the guardian of women, childbirth, fertility, and witchcraft. Well, look no further than your Starbucks cup. That is Mother Gaia. This title also is referred to as Ishtar, and also in Assyrian and Babylonian culture, this goddess is known as Astarte. Astarte was thought to be the wife of the false god Baal, also known as Moloch. The motivation of women to worship this fertility goddess as the bearing of children was greatly desired among the women of that era. The worship of this queen of heaven was rampant among the pagan civilizations, and it even became very popular among the Israelites as well. In fact, queen of heaven is found in Jeremiah 44, 17 through 25. God reminds Jeremiah that the people in their disobedience and idolatry caused the Lord to become very angry with them to punish them with calamity. And they replied they had no intentions of giving up their worship of idols, pouring out drink offerings. Hmm. Speaking of drink offerings, look no further than your favorite beverage. Now, what's really interesting about this mermaidian marine spirit is that the earth is actually ruled by water spirits and the sons of Belial. Every country, state, and region, every city, town, village in the world, did you know there's marine principalities and marine ruler evil spirits that have been assigned? Do you know that water demons rule over government? They work in marriages and divorces and they work in a nation. Yeah, that's right. The marine kingdom is a spiritual sovereignty that is recent recently came into view due to the world elitist openly worshipping the goddesses of the ocean and the moon. Again, Gaia. The marine kingdom is the highest influential power of the fallen evil forces of all demonic kingdoms on the earth. Satan's hosts dwelling in the sea are known as marine spirits. The marine demonic empire is extremely wicked. The queen of the India Sea is the chief. And when you look at a depiction of her, she is a human being that is possessed by a principality, fallen angels. The queen of the coast is next in command, and she resides within the Atlantic Ocean who is possessed by a fallen angelic principality. Welcome to the great goddess Gaia. So it's very clear to see that this mermaidian marine spirit is none other than a high-level demonic entity and in fact a ruler spirit. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you have Starbucks cups in your home, if you have Starbucks coffee, take it to the Lord, but get rid of those items. What does it say in the Word of God? Deuteronomy 7.26 tells us not to bring anything detestable into your home. Let me read that scripture. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. 
You know what, folks? It's a cursed thing. And you become cursed just like the object. Go read Deuteronomy 7.26. Touch not the unclean thing. Listen, there is an agenda behind Starbucks. It is a globalist, antichrist agenda. And we need to be having no part of it. Do not go into a Starbucks. Don't drive up to a Starbucks. Find a mom and pop coffee house. There's lots of Christian coffee houses too. And in fact, one I've linked below because I've become very fond of them. Believers, we need to steer far from Starbucks. Starbucks is nothing more than a modern day pagan, occult, demonic entity and all its affiliates. Don't be fooled, folks. There is nothing benevolent about Starbucks. In fact, it's seemingly benevolent, but it is indeed malevolent. And you know what? Who needs to pay $7 for an 8-ounce coffee? I hope you've enjoyed this expose I entitled The Satanic Truth Behind Starbucks. Be sure to check out all my social media and all my social media icons are over there at www.sheila.media. Do share this video. Thanks so much for listening. God bless. You, do you record while while the bus is moving, or does it have to come to a stop? Before yeah, well, you... sometimes they don't want to, and they're you know, Gaga, we can't get you know the the frequency's weird, and you know it's sounding a little bit strange, and I'm like, if you don't get this right now, I swear to Lucifer, I'm gonna you know I get a little bit mad.